Today I thank you for your love and for your grace. Father, I pray that you would cause your anointing to rest on me to deliver the message that you put on my heart. Father, I pray that you would, uh, as you put forth your word, Father, I, we declare that we're good ground, ready to receive the engrafted word of God, that we would be changed and changed forever, that we would be better for it, Father, that we would be encouraged and strengthened, Father, that we would walk in faith. Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you for your word. You sent your word and held them. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for your grace. Father, continue to move in our, our midst this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, <clears throat> this week has been kind of an interesting week. You always kind of get into the Christmas holiday and the season and everything, and you want to lean towards speaking on, you know, things along those lines. But this week, I kind of had an interruption. Last week, when I was sharing something, it kind of sparked something inside of me. I'll share that in just a moment. But then as the week progressed, it became very evident to me that the Lord wants to talk about something today. So if you would, please, I'd like to talk about something that's a bit controversial. Uh, people don't understand it, but yet it's there. It's in the Word. It's clear. So are you ready? I want to talk about healing, but specifically I want to talk about fighting the good fight of faith concerning healing, okay? And this is very important. Uh, last week I had made mention of the fact that I'm fighting a battle that claimed the life of my grandmother when I was 15 years old, Grandma Glenna, my dad's mom, and she was like one of my heroes in the faith. My grandma was very dedicated to the church. She spent her life at the church, my grandma was a little firecracker. I get it. I really do. And you guys remind me a lot of my grandmother. And, and, and I love it. I really do. But uh, just a firecracker. <laughs> I mean, my grandma was awesome. She was from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and, and so she was just an amazing person. That's where I get the rosy red cheeks from and the round face. <laughs> my grandpa was not so round faced. But it was Grandpa William. That's where we named Liam from. Will Liam to Liam. Liam James Darter III. So, uh, yeah, good times. Well, my grandma died um, as a complication to diabetes. Uh, my father now has been battling for many years diabetes. Um, we make jokes of it and we, we make light. Hey, you can't have that cookie, put it back, things like that. But it is something that has... He's been fighting and battling. Then uh, a few months ago, I approached my dad and I said, hey, dad, um, I got a question. Why, why do I keep running to the restroom all the time? Like, it's like really kicked off. And he said, it's because your body is trying to filter everything through your kidneys. And I said, why would it do that? He says, because you're becoming diabetic. And I went, whoa. And so I really pressed in and, and I was taught uh, just by experience and from what I went to Rama. Um, that you don't have to be subject to sickness and disease, that Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And blood disease, specifically blood disease, is named as something that we've been redeemed from. Well, what is diabetes? It is a blood disease. It's something that screws up your blood sugar, and it messes with you. And so, therefore, um, this is something that we can fight, and we can win. But it is a fight. And this is what a lot of people don't know and they don't recognize. Yes, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, but does that mean that your victory is handed to you and that no battle is waged on our parts? That's where we're falling short. That's where we're falling short. I had the opportunity also to speak this, this week. When I shared that last week, a little on the inside of me, a little fire caught up. And I'm like, yeah. You know, there's something to that. And I just kind of, you know, set that on the back burner, so to speak. But then as the week progressed, I had somebody come and talk to me and they were sharing with me the struggle that they're going with, go going through something that for years has been on the back burner. They've maintained it. They've controlled it. But now recently it's getting out of control. And I asked them, I said, well, what are you doing to fight this, to combat this? And they said, I'm not confessing this over myself and I said that's exactly right but that's not all okay we're doing the right thing by not claiming this over ourselves by not confessing this over ourselves we're doing right 
But is that all that there is? And a lot of Christians say, well, that's all we know to do. And now we have a problem. Because that's not all there is to do. I want to share, as we're getting ready and, and, and talking about this, um, I want to share some situations that I've seen and experienced and went through that kind of help to show that we can win. We can win this battle. Um, before I get into that, let me just look over my notes. <laughs> um, a lot of times, guys, when we're seeing and talking about healing, when we're thinking about these things, when we're considering these things, a lot of times we hear some spectacular and phenomenal testimonies, right? I mean, David Hawk comes out. He's jumping over, you know, aisles. We're watching. We've literally seen in this church, we've seen legs grow out. We've seen it happen in this church. We've seen miracles. We've actually seen demons coming out of people and people being delivered from demonic oppression. We've seen that here in this church. We've seen and heard some amazing testimonies. How many times, like uh, the, 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 the one time I'm like, hey, I feel like you know, somebody needs to be healed today. We had some healing. Uh, uh, somebody came up. I prayed for them. They're, pray they're having severe back ache, aches and pains and stuff. And I prayed for them. And right there instantly they got healed. I'm like, yes, praise God. So we're seeing some amazing things. But the problem that when we see these things, we also wonder, we, we, we think two things, you know, like, praise God. <gasps> Yay, they got healed. Right? Yeah. We're happy for them, yeah? yeah? But then we're also sitting there scratching our head. Why didn't it work for me? <coughs> come on, guys. Yeah. Let's be honest. How come not me? Things like that. And we have scriptures. Why? But, but, but we don't stop to consider a lot of these things. And so, therefore, when we do have healing lines, yes, yeah, somebody gets healed and then somebody doesn't. They come up and got prayed for, but we didn't see an instant manifestation. So we're starting to think and wonder, well, gee, that wasn't for everybody. We start to come up with doctrines. And we, he we, we heard some, heard, we've heard some lousy things, heard, heard it is, <laughs> We've heard some lousy things, some bad doctrines that have taught us things like, well, healing's not for today or must not have been the will of God. Has anybody heard that? Yeah. Must not have been the will of God. Well, when we pray, let's pray things, well, if it be thy will. You know, that's what we pray. We would want to lean into that. But that's not the way that we're supposed to pray, not concerning healing. Hello? What about, what about, you know, and I, and I heard this and I, I'm stepping on toes. I get it. But I'm going to tell you what, if we need to be corrected concerning our healing, then let's be corrected. Let's move over into a position to receive healing, not, not receive it and say, well, it must have been God's fault. Like, really? Why would we do that? Oh, I know, because we have too much pride. We don't want to take a knee and say, Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? How do I position myself for healing? You know, and I've heard this. And a lot of times people use this for this subject. A lot of times they use it for other subjects, and that's fine. But they say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> well, hold on now. Concerning healing? Concerning what Jesus... Would you ever say that about salvation? No. no. Why? Because we're pretty certain when it comes to salvation that God is willing that none should perish. Amen. Amen. That's a verse. Well, what about when it comes to healing? And unfortunately, some people don't know whether or not it's God's will for healing. Some people don't know how to approach it. Some people know, in this case, this person knows that it's God's will for them to walk in wholeness and healing. But they don't know much about the fight. They don't know beyond, well, I'm not going to speak that over myself. And that's where I think a lot of people fall into. And so therefore, it's not going to have the results that we need to have. I'm going to tell you right now, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as He is Lord of your life, then you have every right to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus Amen. concerning your healing. Yes. But does that mean that everybody's going to exercise that right or enjoy that? The answer is no. And this is where my heart breaks. Because this is something that is so big, so massive. And today I want to look at this. And I, I told Kelly, I'm, I'm struggling putting this message together. You know why? Because healing is something I've studied. I've looked into. I went to Africa. I came out of a Baptist church. I had no idea that healing still happened today. And I'm not knocking the Baptist church. I thank God for the foundation that I received there. But when it came to the current working miracle powers of God, 
had no clue, had no idea. We didn't know. Well, gee, do we automatically assume because we attend a four-square church or a Pentecostal church that somehow or another that we're dun 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 dun? <coughs> no. And that's sad to me because there are so many Christians who are struggling and they can experience victory in these areas. I said last week, I'm not going to receive this. I'm not going to. I told my dad, I'm not denying the facts. The facts are there. But I'm appealing to a greater truth. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so when we see something happen and we're gravitating toward the spectacular and the supernatural, we kind of tend to put all of our eggs in that basket. When we see the prayer lines, the special mir miracles and the special ministers and revivals and healing and things like that, we see all that happen and we get all excited and we put all of our eggs in that basket and we think, gee, if I can only make it to the prayer line or the special meeting or if this evangelist comes to town, I will get healed. Whoa, hold on. Jesus is already in town. Okay. His word is already in town. Okay, what we're looking at is the spectacular. We're walking by sight, not by faith. And this is something that we need to make a serious correction and adjustment in. We make excuses, excuses and repeat some bad doctrines instead of making adjustments and fighting the good fight of faith. And again, a lot of times people just don't know any better. They have no idea how to, how to stand in faith or how to fight the good fight of faith they have no idea and it kind of brings me back to Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 where the scripture says my people perish for a lack of knowledge come on guys my people perish for a lack of in other words they don't know they don't know who they are they don't know what belongs to them they don't know who I am they don't know how to fight they're perishing. Why? Because they don't know enough. So then we need to educate ourselves. We need to go and find out what God's word has to say. It's not a new doctrine. This book is over 2,000 years old. And we're not getting it. Well, let's get it. Why? Because Jimmy Darter, facing a very real circumstance, diabetes is not something you choose. It comes at you. And it's today. Today. But I refuse to kneel. I refuse to allow it to dictate my life. The Lord gave me an analogy concerning this this week that I'm like, aha, that's a good analogy. I'm going to speak about it. Okay, and here it is. Your body is like a ship. And you're the captain. And you'll either be the captain or you'll be the slave. Satan wants you to be the slave. He wants to tell you how to rule and reign your ship as subordinate. But as a captain, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, you're called to be the captain, not the slave. When it comes to our bodies, guys, we're supposed to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Not the slaves. A lot of times when I see this situation happening and I see situations. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a couple instances that I've that I've fought this and we've won victoriously, decisively, amazingly, miraculously with God's help. The first time I saw this and was able to put this into practice was when my mom got cervical cancer. And we were, we were part of a church denomination that didn't know much about this. But I had went to Africa and I watched people being healed left and right. I saw people who were blind got healed. I saw it happen. Okay? I saw people who were deaf. I saw them receive their healing. I witnessed these things. And I saw people who literally had died from HIV come back to life. I saw this. I, I talked with them. They had death certificates with their name on it. Three days in the morgue. 
beat that. Okay, Lazarus, for whatever. <laughs> four days, right? But I'm talking modern day things. When you read about amazing people like, like uh, John G. Lake, the miracles he did, Smith Wigglesworth, wow, Superman of faith. You guys know Smith Wigglesworth? Ever heard the name? This guy, when he showed up to a funeral, people got nervous. Why? Because he raised like 18 or 19 people from the dead. He walked into a funeral, grabbed the guy up and said, live in Jesus' name. And the guy collapsed to the floor. And people were like, oh, oh, why would you do this? And he'd pick him up again and said, live in Jesus' name. And the guy would collapse. I will not accept defeat. He picks him up again. People are mortified. The minister's like, gosh, get this guy out of security. Security. <laughs> Paul, where are you at, bro? You let him in. Smith, let this guy out. He picks him up again. Live in Jesus' name. And the guy <sighs> comes back to life. It happened for real. These things are amazing. Why didn't they receive the healing? Well, that's what I want to talk about. I get fired up on this subject. Why? Because I've received a lot of persecution over this subject. And I've seen it happen again and again and again. Testimony after testimony. And this fires me up. Why? Because this is one of the reasons when I came back from Africa that I, st I, I wanted to come back to Price. I made it out, yo. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, I grew up here. I was born in Price. People say, oh, where were you born? I was born in Price. Oh, you're one of those. No, I'm not one of those. I made it out. The Lord brought me back. Can we be clear about that? I've actually made it around the globe, okay? Hello. <laughs> Been to Hawaii. That was beautiful. Been to North Alaska, up above the Arctic Circle. The kind of cool stuff, right? Been to Africa. <laughs> I tell people, yeah, I got married in Moscow. And they say, wow, you have traveled. Well, Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, but it's right there close to Canada, okay? Coeur d'Alene, Canada. We're, we're somewhere in the, in the ballpark. No, I made it out. But why did God bring me back here? Because he wants this message here. He wants the people of Price to know that his healing power didn't stop at Carbon County's border or Utah border. That the power of God will go wherever people of God want it to go. And if they would learn how to fight the good fight of faith, guess what? You can walk in victory. We're kind of peculiar, Davey and I. We're kind of peculiar in the sense of we believe that God can actually heal people. We don't have to be subject to, to drugs. You know that they're an evil, evil taskmaster. They will wreck your life and you can't even stop it. Why? Because you're hooked. You're done. But are you? In Christ Jesus, we can experience freedom. We believe this. This is who we are. This is what we preach. This is what we teach. This is what we try to encourage and equip people with. That you can walk in freedom. Who the Son sets you free can be free indeed. Yeah. We believe this. We live this. We've seen it. Yeah. And we'll fight for it. Yeah. Well, when my mom got cancer, we are attending a church. I didn't quite believe in healing, but I saw it, I stoked up about it. And I remember the day, I'll never forget the day that my mom had to go to that doctor's appointment. She was nervous. The doctor said, I need to talk to you. You need to come to the office. Can't really tell you over the phone. We need to talk. And she knew that this was not good news. And she said, can you pray for me to have a good report? And I said, I can't pray for that. Why? Because it's not in the scriptures. Pray to God to have a good report. No, there's giants and walled cities in the land. Hello. But what I can believe, God, whatever report comes out that doctor's mouth, that we can go to fight it. And so she goes off, kind of irritated at me that I didn't pray the way she wanted me to. She comes back and she says, I said, how'd it go? And this is many years ago. We had a clothing ministry. We didn't start it, but we were the people who helped perpetuate it and help it kept going. Um, and we were, I was at the clothing ministry at that time, and she came in and she said, well, I have cervical cancer. And she started just crying and broken, hurting, scared. And I looked at her and I said, Mama, we can fight this. We can fight this. Am I lying? I said, we can fight this. 
And she says, how? I said, all right, here's what we're going to start doing. First thing I want to point out in the path to victory is to start allowing fight to rise up inside you. Amen. Allow it to take its place. A lot of times people think that anger is a bad thing. Well, I'm going to kind of side in with what C.S. Lewis had to say about emotions, okay? He said concerning emotions, it's kind of like a keyboard, a piano. Emotions are all the keys on there. There's no such thing as a bad note. It's just a note out of place. No such thing as a right note. It's just struck at the right time. I'll give you, for instance, love, right or wrong. Right. We would tend to say right. But what if it comes to mother love of your own kids at the sacrifice of the neighbor kids or everybody else's kids? Now it's out of place. Come on. What about fight? Is fight right or wrong? Depends. When it's time to stand up for your country or stand up for your family or stand up for the things of God, it's time to fight. Not be ignorant, not be mean, but it is time to fight. Well, what about hate? Well, God hates. How do we make sense of that? There's things that the Bible clearly says that God hates. So it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of when we incorporate these things. A long time ago, one of the guys that I, I was playing tennis in high school, and I was fighting really hard to win. I wanted the first place medal. And I got second place medal. And I was really kind of like, man, I could have had this guy. Like we were battling out on the court. We were really after each other. We were really fighting for that first place prize, that, that, that medal. And I told him, I'm going to crush you next year. He says, no, you won't. I said, yes, I will. He says, no, you won't. I'm graduating this year. <laughs> well, then I'm doing pretty good if I'm a junior and you're a senior and I took you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I almost got you, man. But I got to talking to this guy and he said, you know one of the things that makes me excel the most, try harder? And I said, what's that? He said, failure. And I was a kid. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> Like, what are you talking about? Failure? Failure helps you succeed? <laughs> okay. No, he said, no, I'm serious. Because it shows me where I don't have enough in me and I need to work on. And then I'll step up to the plate again. And I'm going to do better. I'm going to push. I'm going to fight. Amen. I'm like, wow. Okay, okay. I, I, I kind of, I, okay, all right. No, we're cool. I get you. Well, that's kind of what I'm talking about today. Because so many Christians don't even know that it's God's will, if it's God's will. And they don't know to even fight. And then other Christians do hear testimony, that wild pastor up there, anointed, preaching the sermon, saying it's God's will to heal. But they don't know how to incorporate these truths into our lives. <clears throat> In either case, um, if we would just simply follow the plan and do it God's way, we can experience victory. My mom today, how many years ago was that, by the way? 11 years. My mom has been cancer-free 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we put our faith to fight against that cancer, and we kick the hell out of it. Amen. And I don't say that to be overly dramatic, somewhat dramatic, but... <laughs> I don't say that in a, in a cussing way. I, I mean it in a, by the power of God. We put hell back in its place. And so how did we do it? Years later, I had an opportunity to minister to a man in this church. His name is Robert Valdez. He's still alive. Evan and Anastasia had just, just seen him recently. And then he came up here to Price. He used to live here at Price. You guys remember Robert Valdez? Do you guys remember the time that the doctors told him he had like six weeks left to live? How many years ago was that? Five years ago? Um, the day that that happened, Robert was right over here, 
And he went through the service, and I could tell something was wearing on him, kind of heavy on his heart. And after the service, I'm like, man, it's so good to see you. How you doing, man? He says, I'm not doing good. And I knew that he was having stomach problems. He kept saying, I've got stomach pains and stuff like that. Well, he, he goes to the doctor, and the doctor took an x-ray, and it was a complete black mass, completely black. And they said, he has a tumor, it's so, it is cancerous, and it's so far gone, there's no way that we can operate. Um, and the doctor told him, you have six weeks left to live. And he's sitting right here. And all of a sudden, as I'm talking to him, and he's sharing, and he's, he's, he's breaking down and starting to cry, something sparked on the inside of me. What was that? Fight. I'm getting angry. I'm getting ready to pounce. I got fight welling up on the inside of me. And I looked at Robert and I said, Robert, we can beat this. I will fight this with you if you are willing to fight it with me. I can't do it for you, but I can do it with you. And he said, I want to fight. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm in Rocky Balboa. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, I'm on fire, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, the ding. You guys remember that Rocky where he's like, Adrian doesn't believe in him, but then halfway through she changes, and boy, things change. You guys know what I'm talking about? That's how I felt. Fight. Fight was welling up on the inside of me, and I'm like, oh, baby. Well, we went and fought that thing, and he had j just a short amount of time. Well, his testimony goes, and if he watches online on, on occasions. And so if he, Robert, you're tagged, Robert Valdez. Uh, you, 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 tell, you tell on me. If I'm not telling it the way it was. Um, he had to go up to the doctor, and the, like the day before, they took an x-ray, all black. He goes into the doctor, and I'm, we're pumping this thing. We're with faith, okay? We're, we're mowing this sucker down. One of the, the vehicles, one of the, the things that we used is this book right here, Healing Scriptures, okay? We want the Word of God to fight a supernatural enemy that we cannot battle any which way. It's impossible, okay? The doctor said, sorry, we're done. Can't do any more. Well, they go up to open him up just to see how, how, how severe this is spread to other organs. And when they open him up, they can't find anything. They look around, they finally find something about the size of a ping pong ball, a golf ball maybe, ping pong ball, and they're like, there's a tumor. And the doctor that's there taking this out says, if I didn't take the x-ray myself, this is what Robert told me, if I didn't take the x-ray myself, I would think that we got the wrong patient. Because it's gone. It's gone. One day, it's there. The next day, it's gone. And they pull this out and they said, if I didn't know myself, I would not have believed this. That's from the doctors. They said, what did you do? And he said, it's glory to God. And they, no. What did you do? <laughs> they said, I, I'm fighting this in faith. And they said, well, we all, whatever you did, it worked. Amen. Five years later. Here's Robert. He moved down to be closer to his family. Well, if it happened for my mom, it happened for Robert, it's happened for so many, why can't it happen now more? It happened to you. There's another one. We fought in faith. We've got some faith fighters, but we need more. Why? Because I'm facing a battle myself, and I'm going to win. And I got people around me, close to me, dear to me, brothers to me, sisters to me, who are fighting battles. And they're doing everything that they know to do, but there's not, it's not going to get them over the hump. There's more we've got to do. So, other, other situations, uh, Pastor Dick, fight welled up inside me. And when I got that phone call at 1230, I'm thinking, this could be bad news, but I don't really care. I don't really care because if, he, if she calls and says he's, he's gone, I say, I want to go see him. What do you suppose pastor's going to do? 
You know why I would go see him? Because fight was ignited in me. I didn't ignite it. Something sparked in me. Then I'm going to stand in the gap and I'm going to pray for my brother. And I'm not going to let Satan win. I'm going to stand in the gap and I have the power of God behind me and with me and in me and through me and it's going to change this stupid circumstance. And I know that death will cower. Why? Because I read about it. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus walks forth. One of the things that Jesus commissioned his disciples to do is go lay hands on the sick (laughs) and bring back the dead. But yet we don't often hear about that. Why? Because a lot of people don't have enough fight in them to do it. Well, I think that it's time that we rise up and fight. We get after it. So I want to show you some scriptures. The scripture that really like brings it home to me. Okay, we're at page three. We've got five more to go, right? All right. The Bible says that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. First John chapter five, verse four. Do you have that on the overhead? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Everybody say overcomes. Overcome. Yeah, that's really convincing. <laughs> Come on, guys. Are you guys going to fight this with me? You're going to learn how to do this or what? Say overcomes like you mean it. Overcome. Overcomes. <laughs> For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Amen. Listen to what it says in the uh, NLT. I love this. For every child of God defeats the evil, this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. Amen. This is a key. You want to walk in victory? This is a key. A pretty big one. Faith. Do you know it's not dependent upon his anointing? It's not dependent upon Jesus anointing. I'm going to say something, and it might rock your boat. I'm going to say it all the same. God has done all that he's going to do about your situation. He doesn't need to do anything more. No, no, no. i got new situations coming up every day. He's not going to do anything more. Why? He's already given you the victory. You just need to learn how to walk it out. Do you know when it comes to your financial prosperity, he's done everything he's going to do. It's up to you to walk in the light of it. When it comes to healing, it is no different. It's up to us, you and me, to walk in the light of what we learn and grow. It's, it's my people perish for lack of knowledge. In other words, the answer's there. Walk in the light of it and you won't perish. Oh, Oh, this is good stuff. One of the things that we can do, guys, and it's a tool that we often don't do. Go back to our analogy of, of, you know, our bodies are like a ship. We're supposed to be the captain of our ship, not the slaves of it. God wants us to be in control of our lives and to be the masters and conquerors under his lordship and direction. But Satan would have us to believe that we are subject to sickness and disease. We are subject to our appetites, our desires, our bodies. We're subject to them. That's what Satan wants us to believe. But that is not true. You are not subject to your desires, your appetites. You're not subject to sickness or disease. You don't have to be subject to your body. One of the ways I know this is because the Bible introduces a concept called fasting. And if, the, if you couldn't master your own body, then you could not fast. Come on. This is a tool in our arsenal that we don't take good advantage of. What is fasting? It's to put your body under. Remind, itself, remind yourself of its place. You don't rule and reign. Bless God. It's the Spirit of God inside of my spirit that brings you into subject. That's why we fast. One reason why we fast. Can you imagine a body with its desires and appetites unchecked? We don't have to imagine it. We could look at the world in which we live. No wonder why sex is out of control and drugs are so abused and alcohol is so abused and people are literally living in bondage because of these things. Well, we're standing up saying, "Uh uh-uh, you don't have to. You don't have to. We can rise up. 
What do you got to do? Feed your spirit. Get your spirit stronger than your flesh. You'll always walk in victory, Chad. You'll always walk in victory if, if you'll keep your spirit stronger than your flesh. Amen. Always. You're guaranteed victory by Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. You can always have that. But you got to do your part. What is that? Feed your faith. Feed your spirit. Stay strong in Him. One way. One. Go to church. <laughs> Worship. Read your Bible. Pray. And fast. I've seen too many people in our community fall to things they should never fall. Christians. I'm talking about Christian brothers and sisters who have given up the ways of God and embraced evil doctrine because they didn't keep their body in check. Sexual sins are rising. I see families incorporating this new multifamily whatever. That is not the way God intended it. You let your appetites rule, you're departing from God. Can't have it both ways. Well, when I think of the subject of faith and fighting, I think of David and Goliath. And if you want to see how to win victories, this is what we need to look at. Because the faith principles are there. But perhaps we haven't seen them. So should we go and look at these real quick and just, just really chew on these? Because the answer for your victory is right there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting with verse 1. Are we ready? Buckle in, baby. Here we go. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were joined at Saka. 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 Help me out. Anything? Nothing? Okay. Saka, which belongs to Judah. They uh, encamped between Saka and Azekah in if his demon. And Saul, okay, we made it through it, yay. Uh, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the, vil, the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. <clears throat> Verse 3. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Come on down from Gath, uh, whose height was six cubits in a span. Okay, in other words, like nine feet tall. Dude's a giant, bro. Puts NBA players to shame, makes them cry. Okay? Uh, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat of mail was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Now, instead of trying to figure out that this is like, you know, well, how much is that weigh? The point is super heavy. Okay, like 5,000 shekels of bronze. In other words, this guy was chiseled, built, okay? Uh, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Verse 7. Now the staff of, of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Again, don't know what that is, but what I'm getting is it's heavy. Okay, this guy is ripped. He's huge. Like he shows up on the scene, fee, fi, fo, fum, yeah, okay? Like, I smell the blood of an Israelite. All right, he, uh, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went out before him, and he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you, <clears throat> sorry, why have you come to, <laughs> yeah, okay, why have you come out to line up, he's probably like, why have you come out to line up for battle? I am, am I not a Philistine and you're the servants of Saul? Okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Could I say it like this? Listen up. Bad reports are going to come and you can't stop them. You're going to always be facing a situation Well, oh my gosh, a bill collector, honey, we ain't got enough money. You're going to face situations. No, no, I believe in prosperity. What are you going to tell that? I, uh, uh, I say no in Jesus' name, click. <laughs> no, come on, man. Your doctor's going to call you in and say, hey, uh, I have bad news. Bad reports are going to come, guys. Let's just buckle that down. We're not promised a life that bad reports don't come. Do you know that so-and-so relapsed again? Did you know about that? Do you know that uh, we've got to let a few people go? You're one of the guys. You're one of the gals. I know it's the Christmas season. You probably just put out on the credit card a big old lofty payment. But, I mean, the country's in recession. Do you know that uh, mom and dad were diagnosed with COVID? Do you know that so-and-so, and we were just at their house, they, uh, they contracted COVID? Guys, bad reports are all around us, and they're going to be there. Something that the Lord told me, I'm never going to forget this, and I want, I'd really appreciate it if you guys would remember this too. The Lord told me there's always been giants in the land. There's always been walled cities. There's always obstacles for you to overcome. Are you okay with that? So here we have fee fi fo from Mr. Goliath of Gath coming out saying, give me a man. Man up, somebody, anybody. One on one. Okay, come on. This isn't fair. You're nine feet tall. You got hundreds of pounds of armor. Like, dude, you're a warrior from your youth. This is like meeting a Spartan <laughs> on the battlefield. And I ain't talking about the Spartan 300. I'm talking about like Master Chief. <laughs> like kill aliens, you know, 117. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Few of you do, right? <laughs> you don't meet this guy on the battlefield and live if you're in opposition to him. You hope he's on your side, okay? This guy tears through people like Captain Crunch. It's just happening. Well, this is the situation. Nobody wants the bad report. But guess what? He's here. Nobody wants the bad report. Jimmy, this is because your body is now becoming diabetic. Who wants that report? Not me. But I've learned how to fight it. <laughs> and giants still come down. Amen. We're doing okay so far? So, natural problems, in-your-face situations, out-of-control circumstances, giants and walled cities are still in the land. Verse 12, let's go to verse 12 through 24. It says, Now David oh, was the son of the Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the, the man was old, advanced in years. Yeah, because of his sons, right? In the days of Saul, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul into battle. The names of his three sons who went into battle, battle were Eliab, the firstborn. Next to him was Abinadab. And the third was Shammah. Sh Shammah? Shammah. Shammah. Okay, verse 14. David was the... Youngest. Hmm. Something to consider. David was the youngest, and the three of the oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented himself for 40 days, morning and evening. So twice a day, guys, for over a month. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to their captain of their, of their thousands. And see how your brothers fare. And bring back news of them to me. So in other words, here, I'm sending you on an errand, son. Youngest son. Sending you on an errand. Go take a lunch to your brothers. Uh, let's take some lunch to their captains as well. You know? And your job is to take lunch. See, observe. Report back to me. This is like a news anchor guy, right? Okay, now Saul 
and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So were they fighting with the Philistines? No, they were drawn up ready to fight. Okay, point of nobody was fighting. Not yet. But they're there casting insults back and forth. So a verbal fight. <laughs> fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to... Uh, to out to the fight and shouting for the battle. Verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Yo, hi guys, high five, what's going on? Verse 23. Then all he, uh, then as he talked with them, there was the champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Here's a key. Did David get a bad report too? Yes. He heard it. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. This is something I want to point out, guys. A bad news situation came and it affected everybody. Fear of the situation, impending doom, put them as subjects to the circumstances. Come on, guys. They knelt. They were afraid. They took a knee. Verse 24, again, let's read. It says, uh, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully affla- afraid. So the men of Israel said, uh, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. They'll give him his daughter and, and give, him, give, give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? In other words, say it again. There's reward? (laughs) Okay. Now check this out. For, let's read this together. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. This is where most everybody falls into. Christians. Whoa, don't you touch me. I'm a child of God. David knew his place. He knew his God. Why did he use the term uncircumcised Philistine? Because He was coming up against a covenant God and his people. And David says, buddy, you're outside the covenant. You can't talk like this and win. We serve a covenant God. That means we do our part, he will do his part, and you are nothing. (laughs) Buddy. And this is where most Christians are. They realize, hey, in my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. He's my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We know this, but yet how many of us are still struggling and and failing and, and not experiencing the victories? Because we're confessing it right. We're understanding our position. This is good. This is right. But it's not enough. It's not enough. Question, is the battle won? From the natural standpoint, guys, there's a giant still out there still saying, fee fi fo I'm going to kill y'all. 
Y'all dead. <clears throat> so David, not accepting the things said by the impending doom, he's not speaking it over himself, right? He's not letting the, this report be his master, good, but instead he appeals to something. What? Verse 26, uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, he appeals to the covenant. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant with God. The world doesn't care about your covenant rights with God. The world doesn't care. Well, you better care about them. It is a very important that we learn about our rights and our position in Christ and our covenant with God so that we can allow the fight to start to well up in ourselves. Now notice the battle is not yet won, but fight is starting to well up in David. Fight is. Because when what, what, what did the king say you get? You get like no taxes? <laughs> okay. A pretty wife? What? And riches and honor? <laughs> Tell, tell, tell me again. Give me the scoop again. There's things that we need to take notice of. Three things that I see. Not the only things, but these are three things that are very important. He didn't let the bad report be spoken over him. He didn't claim it. He didn't ignore the circumstances either. Faith doesn't pretend an obstacle doesn't exist. I need to say that again, guys. Please listen. Faith doesn't pretend that an obstacle doesn't exist. You ain't got enough money. Your health is collapsing. Faith doesn't ignore it. My dad's saying, Jimmy, your, your body's becoming diabetic. I'm not ignoring that. But I'm appealing to a covenant God and say, naturally speaking, I'm screwed, uh, sunk. I can't say that. Thing. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that no more. I'm sunk. Naturally speaking. But I'm appealing beyond the natural. I'm going to appeal to a supernatural God who's in covenant with me. Important. Hello? He was not ignorant of his God. He was not ignorant of his position with his God. You cannot be ignorant and victorious. Number three, he allowed fight to start to well up on the inside of him. Give place to that sucker. When you get that little <clears throat> on the inside, that's right. Could it be that God is stirring you up to fight? To fight the good fight of faith? To be more than a conqueror? To have an opportunity to conquer? To be more than, a, to have an opportunity to overcome something? God's not out there trying to throw giants and walled cities at us. But he did leave them for us to deal with. I wonder why. Oh, I know. So that we'll have something to exercise our faith and learn how to walk in faith. And when we come against a giant, regardless of how big and tough and ugly and stinky that stupid guy is, you, don't, you haven't met my God yet. He's about to show up through me. Because I'm going to walk in faith against this. Amen. You're telling me once you've done heroin, you're always going to be stuck on heroin? I don't think so. You've not met my God, Mr. Heroin. <laughs> Methamphetta what? <laughs> I don't think so. Addiction what? Master who? You start to allow a fight to well up inside us. This is how we start to win. Okay. Now, this is not all. Oh, my goodness. Are we doing okay? I, I, I got seven pages left. No, I'm just kidding. Verse 26, it says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He knew who he was. He knew who his God was. He's not accepting this. He's not speaking this over himself. Right. And the people answered him in the same manner and said, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he, was, when he, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, his own brother. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? 
I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. You have come down to see the battle. In other words, you little twerp, shut up. <laughs> Guess what? That's exactly what I've experienced from brothers and sisters in Christ. When I say, you can walk in, in wholeness. You can walk in healing. Oh, shut up. What do you know? You know, auntie so-and-so died. She had the same thing you did. <clears throat> you know what David did to this? Oh, shucks, Eliab, you're right. You're my older brother. I better listen to you. I'm going to go home now. Not! You know what he did? He ignored it. I remember a time when Jesus took the family of their own relative out of the house. Jesus put the people out. It's not even his house. Why? Because he don't need an evil report. The damsel is not dead. She's only asleep. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them out, he went in, sat next to her and said, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto you, arise. What did he do? He ignored scoffers. Amen. You better start listening. You want your healing? Don't give place to naysayers. Don't listen to this garbage. You either stand with God or you stand with the world. Here we go. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, in other words, here's somebody speaking the language of faith. When he's speaking in faith, they were reported them to Saul and he sent for him. Whoa, whoa, who's this little whippersnapper? Uh, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight the Philistine. Oh, you see fight? Do you see fight in this young boy? Yes. And Saul said to, his, to, to David, you are not even able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth. And this man's a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took, took out a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when, I, when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard, sucker, come on. And I struck it and I killed it. I'll pounce you with my hands. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, like what? Will be like one of them, seeing he has fled or excuse me, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the, paw, from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Amen. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Amen. Now this is fighting language. He's appealing to two things, lions and bears. Why is that important? Because you as a Christian, you as a believer, you as a follower of Jesus Christ need to look in your past and say, God was faithful to me with that stupid lion. God was faithful to me when that bear come up against me. God was faithful to me when I didn't have the money to pay and God supernaturally gave me blessings. God was faithful to me that one time that we couldn't have kids. And now we got kids, yo. <laughs> Hello. That happened for me and Kelly. You wonder why there's a big gap between Anna and Shelby? We do too. We wanted kids right quick. Well, that didn't happen. I actually had to move in and, and call my brother, Grady Pickett, a person of faith, say, will you believe God with me? Because we're trying to have a second kid. We just, we ain't having kids and we've had a miscarriage and it's kind of hard. And, 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 and this is not what our, our heart's desire is. So can you move into faith with me? Oh, and then Shelby comes along. We're starting to wonder, golly, can we not have kids? What's the deal? Like we just had one. Is that, the, is that it? And something has to give way because we're moving ourselves into a position of faith. I'm not going to listen to bad reports. I'm going to appeal to my God who does miracles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so I can look at this situation. Jimmy, you're getting diabetes. I can look at that and say, hey, buddy, <laughs> lion, <laughs> bear. Huh? God was faithful and God will deliver me still. Amen. Hello. Okay. Now something I want to point out real quick, guys. From the natural standpoint, still 
with all this going on, still lions and bears in our belt buckles, and we got the feather and the hat thing, right? Okay, uh, 1970s <laughs> reference, whatever. You got the feather and hat. Right? You understand the concept, though, right? Yeah. Where you got you 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 overcame it, you conquered it. You you got the feather and the hat. You got the T-shirt to show it. You know, Y2K, what? Oh, I got the T-shirt, been there, done that. <laughs> y, Y2K, never mind. <laughs> that was too far. Okay, well, at any point, guys, at any rate, God was faithful to me in my past. I'm not giving place to this. Fight's welling up inside me, but the battle hasn't been fought yet. I'm getting ready for it. Are you starting to see this? Guys, can we go over just a few minutes? Because this is something that's very significant. This is where the victory lies. It hasn't happened yet. But in the faith realm, it's beginning to happen. It's starting to where that giant comes out, buddy. <sighs> feel just as good as I did 30 minutes ago, 30 days ago, 40 days ago. I feel awesome. You guys are not getting it we're here to kill you put you in our your place we're here to rule and reign you guys suck your god is nothing that's the world outside saying the same things today <coughs> and yet christians are going oh crap i got a bad report from the doctor and your neighbors are looking in your window seeing you losing it why because you don't know whose you are who god is You've given place to this. It's been spoken over you. I don't receive that. Well, then don't. Let faith rise up. Let the fight come. Look at your past. God was faithful. He's going to do it again. But beyond that, guys, the battle's not yet there because the fight still needs to take place. Very important. I'm going to skip ahead. Nothing will change until you go and fight it. Amen. You need not claim it. You need to know what Jesus has done for you on the cross at the whipping post, that our God is a covenant God. You need to let that fight well up in you. You need to feed on lions and bears. But then it's time now it's time to fight. What do we see? I'm going to skip ahead to verse 48. It says, And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried. Can I say it like this? I'm ready for you! Amen. David hurried and ran toward the army to meet this Whoa, Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Under natural circumstances, guys, this is impossible. No, you could... Not with a guy. Did you read about the armor he was having? Yo, he had a armor carrier and this much mail and a helmet. Wait, what? A helmet? What? He had all kind of stuff going on, guys, to protect him. Something supernaturally is now taking place. I believe that that angel went. <laughs> Could have been in slow motion, too. Goliath's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, ow. Oh, oh. I don't know. You don't know. What I do know is that it went deep. And it gave way. And the supernatural kicked in when he was on the field. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. Cut off his head with it. Do, is that the last verse? Yeah. The big <laughs> exclamation point. Yes. Why? We can be victorious, but we've got to be willing to put our boots on the battlefield. Not stand behind, not just wait in our prayer closet. God, 
They said, I'm going to have diabetes because grandma had it and dad has it. And now I'm, my body's getting it. And what am I going to do? I know I'll just stand in faith. Listen, buddy, I got to go fight this sucker. That's why I'm losing weight. And people say, what's your secret? God. I really don't know how I'm doing it. I drink a lot of water. I've shared that. But I've always drank some water. Well, I've cut out soda. But I've, I still drink a soda from time to time, you know? <laughs> and I even have a beer on occasions. I really do. Pastor, you ain't supposed to. Really? Show me in the Bible. <laughs> pastor can't have beer. No, the Bible says pastor can't have beer before he ministers. <laughs> There's the difference. <laughs> or else Jesus would have never turned water into wine. wine. And many other scriptures like that. You guys remember, remember the Proverbs 31 woman? I dare you to read Proverbs 31, the first three verses. Talks about wine. He says, oh, buddy, give some wine to some people who are suffering. Why? So that they will forget their trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, it's not for kings, oh, Lemuel, it's not for kings to get drunk. Why? Because they've got to stand in judgment. As a, as a leader, you've got to watch yourself. You can't go up there and minister like that. Uh-uh. As a, as a judge... You're going to get up there and have that judge all sloppy drunk while you're being, he's about to pronounce your judgment? Uh huh. No thanks. We'll wait till you're sober. Because you might give me four lifetimes, and I've got one. Four lifetimes of imprisonment. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Listen, I'm going to fight this. And I'm encouraging you who are struggling how to fight this too. One, you've got to give place to that fight. Let fight well up inside you. Know who you are and whose you are. Know that he is walking in covenant with you. I have so many more scriptures to go through. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who believes God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Matthew chapter 9 verse 27 through 30. Then Jesus departed from there and two blind men followed him crying out and saying unto him, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind man came to him and Jesus said to him, Do you believe? There's the key. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to my anointing. Wrong. According to your faith. Let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In other words, God's a good giver. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. Just as your soul prospers. Wait, what? God wants us in good health? According to 1 John, yes. Or 3 John, excuse me. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. It says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, I wonder if God's willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him uh, also freely give us all things? Amen. You want a verse to stand on? That's a big one. In other words, when you're going to, hey, Lord, can you heal me from diabetes? Hey, listen, I sent my son to die for you. You think I'm going to say no to that? That's a little thing. My son dying for the entire sins of the world was a big thing. I ain't going to give you a big thing and withhold a little thing. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll give you that too. Yeah. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life. Not death, not sickness, not disease, but life. To your <gasps> mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In other words, you can take and win the natural fight through supernatural means beyond yourself, beyond your own ability. You can't, I can't win diabetes. I can't do it. 
Oh, sure, I can do some things naturally. But listen, this is third generation. This is a walloper. When you are diagnosed, well, you as a child had this and that, and your family history is this and that. What are, you, what, what, what are you trying to tell me? That I have to be subject to this nonsense? I'm going to share a dream, and then, then we'll be done. I'm going to share a dream that I had, uh, it might have been a year ago, a year and a half ago. I had a dream, it was very vivid, and I was having headaches in my dream. And I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have brain cancer. And I said, really? Shocker. He said, and it's advanced to a point that we cannot operate. And I started laughing. And the doctor said, that you understand what we're telling you, right? This is terminal. You're going to die. We can't do anything. And I said, I know. I got gotcha. you. He said, then why are you laughing? Because, Doc, you just told me that you can't do anything about it, but I know somebody who can. And you just told me that you're off the table. I can't even look to you for an answer. But I'm going to fight this in faith with my Jesus, and I'm still going to win. And you know who's going to get all the glory? God. Because I can't do it, and you can't do it, but my Jesus can. That was a dream that I had. I woke up laughing. I'm thinking, well, that was weird. (laughs) I, I would like to not live that dream, Lord. Let's not. But I get the point, and I'll advocate that point. Why? Because we can look to our healer. We can actually have victory when it comes to our physical well-being. We can actually have it. But it's not going to happen automatically. It's not going to happen just because you confess something. It's going to happen because fight welled up inside you. You did not accept it. You are willing to fight. You actually put boots to the line. That's when we have our victory. I hope this stirred you up, church. I really, really do. Like I said, this is a hard sermon to do because there is so much fight in me about this subject. I can spend hours on this and not even exhaust it. So let's stir up. Let's learn how to fight. Healing. The fight of faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak your word with your heart to your people. Father, I pray that there wouldn't be deaf ears today, that people would receive the word of God through my testimony, through your power, through your word. Father, I pray that you would implant a seed in us that will grow to a mighty tree, a seed of faith, a mustard seed. Because those change things too. We love you, Father, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.